I said, Tom's been at Human Rights Watch for over 10 years. He brings a lot of experience in the world of diplomacy, UN peacekeeping, both in Somalia and Liberia, um, as well as work as a journalist, uh, which is pretty exciting to me. That's the field that I came from. Um, and, and through that, he was working with The Guardian, the BBC, and then several local outlets throughout the MENA region. Um, so diverse experience, all of which he puts to work at Human Rights Watch. I'm going to let him introduce the organization, but first I just want to give a shout out to Amy Rao and Gina Maya. Amy's on the board of Human Rights Watch and Gina heads the Silicon Valley office um, and we work closely together. So definitely feel free to follow up with questions to any of us. So I'll let Tom kick it off. Thanks so much, Jesse. And um, I was also gonna just nod to my colleagues and friends sitting behind everyone. I'm not quite sure why. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, no, it's great to have uh, such, such uh, committed support in, in Silicon Valley. It's a, it's a, it's a really important uh, source of funding, but also of uh, you know, uh, energy for, for Human Rights Watch, so, so thanks. Um, so um, I thought I'd, uh, I, I, I wrote some notes on the back of an envelope, and then I ended up on two sides of the envelope. So <laughs> got, but I, I thought I'd start off with um, just a brief introduction to Human Rights Watch, because uh, I think it's useful. Uh, context for you know then deep digging a bit deeper to talk about our methodology and some of the sort of ethical dilemmas of uh, Human Rights Watch's uh, you know, how Human Rights Watch uh, collects its material. Um, so you know Human Rights Watch we often think of as a, a, a research organization and I work on the research side. I'm the deputy director of our program office, which means effectively that I oversee. Um, five of our research uh, programs or divisions, uh, namely the Middle East and North Africa, uh, Europe and Central Asia, women's rights, uh, refugees, um, and uh, the arms division. Um, and uh, we are a research organization. Uh, our, our work is based on our research, um, but we are more than a research organization. We are uh, a change organization. What we seek to do is to uh, is to change uh, bad situations and make them better. Um, so the principle is that we we go out in the field and we do this, you know, first-hand research on uh, human rights abuses all over the world. We work in about 90 countries, um, and uh, and then we we use uh, the research uh, as the basis for. Uh, media and advocacy work which is aimed at changing the situation. So although we are a research organization, the point of it is to secure change. That's what we're after. That's what all of us wake up every morning hoping to do, uh, to, uh, to end human rights crises, to mitigate human rights abuses, and, and so on. And we work, uh, you know, as I've indicated in the description of my, my particular responsibilities, we work both um, regionally, that is, we have country researchers um, in working on about 90 countries around the world, but we also work thematically. So besides uh, the women's rights and refugees program and uh, the um, arms program, which I oversee, we also have a number of other thematic programs like the Children's Rights Division, do work on business and human rights. Um, we're just about to start a, a new program on the environment and human rights. We do. Uh, we have a, an international justice uh, program and another uh, a, a number of other uh, thematic uh, areas. Um, but besides our researchers, in order to affect change, we also have a group of uh, of people we call advocates, um, who uh, are based in. Uh, capitals around the world where we think there is uh, a chance of making a difference. So we have uh, advocates in, in New York at the United Nations. We have advocates in Geneva, which is where the human rights branches of uh, the United Nations are based. Um, we have uh, advocates in Washington, D.C., in Brussels, in uh, the key European capitals, uh, London, Paris, Berlin. Um, and increasingly, where working in areas of regional influence like Brazil, uh, South Africa, uh, Japan, uh, and so on, where we have full-time advocates who are, you know, whose, whose daily job is to 
go out and cultivate relations with government officials and then use the research that is coming in from our, our research divisions to, to, to affect change. Um, and just to give a you know, very quick example of uh, <coughs> one of the areas where we've, um, I, I think, had an impact just in, in the last uh, year or so, um, Burundi, um, a, a very small country in Africa, uh, where there has been, you know, a uh, long history of uh, uh, ethnic, ethnically based ab abuses, which is right next to Rwanda, which obviously had in 1994 uh, the terrible genocide. Burundi has a similar ethnic makeup and has often, you know, been threatened by genocide. Um, our researcher in Burundi, and we have a full-time researcher working on Burundi, uh, uh, started to notice that things were going from, you know, mediocre to, to bad, and from bad to worse, people started turning up uh, dead on the side of the streets and, and so on. This is a country where no newspaper uh, has a permanent correspondent, obviously, because of the media crisis, they just can't afford it. They don't even have correspondents covering Africa these days, a lot of newspapers. Um, and so, really, it was Human Rights Watch who, who blew the whistle uh, and started to, to write about what was going on and analyze what the problem was, what the political context was, uh, uh, but also to make recommendations. Uh, and uh, within, uh, within weeks of us really kind of starting to focus on this, uh, on this uh, crisis, this incipient crisis, we, um, we had uh, you know, spoken at the United Nations Security Council and we'd actually persuaded the United States uh, Nations Security Council to get up and, and fly to Bujumbura, the capital of, uh, of uh, Burundi, um, and, uh, and, and really put the government on notice that, that um, they were being watched. Uh, and also, um, we start, I, I feel that we helped to start the process of uh, you know, a, a, a peacekeeping operation, which still has to be approved, but um, which uh, hopefully will um, Will, will be uh, deployed uh, at some point in the future. So, you know, it's still early days, but, um, and it's also difficult to prove a negative, but uh, I think that unless we had done this work, um, things would have uh, spiraled very quickly out of control. So, and it's just an example of the sort of uh, impact that we can have using our research, uh, using our, which is you know, powerful stuff coming from the ground, um, and then using our network of uh, uh, advocates in capitals like uh, uh, the United Nations, like, like uh, New York, um, but also uh, in Paris, um, which has a particular interest in Burundi, um, uh, to you know to really get people to sit up and take notice and take action. More importantly, and you know if there's time, we can talk about some other examples of, of impact. But what I wanted to do today, and I don't want to, me to be speaking the whole time, is to is to talk a little bit about. <laughs> our um, our methodology. Um, I don't know. Hands up, anyone who's uh, read a Human Rights Watch report. Good. Um, have you read the methodology section in the Human Rights Report? Probably fewer fewer of you will have read the methodology section of the Human Rights Watch report. Uh, and it's not really necessarily there to be read. And I think there are a few people who read Human Rights Watch reports cover to cover. We have press releases which help you to kind of. Uh, avoid having to do that, um, and summaries as well. Um, but the, the, the methodology section of a report is, is very important. Why do you think, anyone got an idea why we need to, to be clear about what our methodology is? Anyone want to have a stab at answering that question? I told you I would be asking you to uh, participate. Why do we need a methodology section in a human rights report? Why do, yeah? Um, potentially to avoid being seen as politically targeting a certain regime, you prove that you did a thorough job. In right, exactly. I mean, we need to be, I, th I think there are two reasons really. One is transparency, right? We need to be transparent about how we went about collecting material for the report. And secondly, um, it's about integrity. Um, it's about uh, showing that uh, our methodology is such that our report ends up being accurate, but also that our research, we collected our research, we went about doing our research in a, in a manner that was ethical. Um, why, 
what, what, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, we, we talk to people uh, in, all, in the course of gathering uh, uh, the material for a Human Rights Watch report. We often talk to people who are in a very precarious state, right? Uh, often they may have been victims of uh, torture or sexual uh, violence, uh, but also they may be people who, by talking to Human Rights Watch, are putting themselves at risk, right? And we need to show that we have done due diligence uh, in conducting an interview with someone who is at risk through talking to Human Rights Watch, that we're not putting them at uh, at, at greater risk, right? That we are protecting their security as far as possible, right? Uh, and that's really what uh, the uh, methodology section is about. It's about transparency, it's about integrity, it's about showing how and why we are accurate and showing <coughs> how and why we have taken all precautions not to uh, put people who we have spoken to um, at risk. Um, uh, let me just give you an example. I mean, I can't go into details because it's, uh, it, it's not something for the public domain, but um, quite recently, uh, Human Rights Watch, a Human Rights Watch res researcher um, was asked to give uh, a witness testimony at a, an international um, criminal tribunal specifically about our methodology uh, and was asked um, a, a string of extremely hostile um, questions by the counsel for the defense of the person who was on, on trial for war crimes. And the aim of the defense counsel was to try to persuade the court that our methodology was deeply dodgy and that we were partisan. And through being able to answer the questions about these very detailed and difficult questions about methodology, um, we were able to avoid that. Um, so what kinds of information do we need to put into a section on methodology? Um, I mean, it's very basic. I mean, first of, first of all, you know, we need to say where we did the research, right, and when we did it. Um, we also need to talk about, you know, uh, who did the research, who the interviewers were. Now, the obvious answer is that, you know, the Human Rights Watch researcher did the interview, but th it may be actually a bit more complicated than that, right? We may have several researchers working on a particular project. One of the researchers might be a consultant. We need to be upfront about that. Uh, we may also have um, uh, it, it used um, interpreters or, or translators. Uh, that can often be actually rather important and was one of the issues that uh, the defense counsel in this uh, case, this war crimes case that I uh, mentioned, uh, 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 raised. Uh, if we use translators, we need to make sure that those translators are properly trained, that they're not, you know, asking questions themselves, that, that they just ask exactly the question that the researcher puts to the interviewee. We need to be clear about that as far as possible in our, in our methodology. Even if it doesn't get into the methodology section of the report itself, we need to be clear ourselves that our methodology is um, unimpeachable. Um, another important thing, we talk about the interviewees. You know, how many interviewees do we uh, um, interview for a particular report is often a crucial question. We did a report a couple of years ago about, in fact, by a former uh, alumnus of Stanford, um, uh, about uh, the massacre at, in Cairo uh, after the, uh, the, the coup d'etat by the military that overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood government. Uh, we did a report on the massacre in which upwards of 800 people were killed in one day um, in a, a suburb of Cairo. Uh, which was the site, if you remember, probably read the news, of uh, a massive uh, protest by the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, uh, and uh, we did the research for that report over a year. In fact, we published the report on the anniversary, on the first anniversary of the, uh, of the massacre. 
How many people do you think we interviewed for that report? <coughs> Anyone want to guess? Have a go. <laughs> 20? 30? How many people? No? We interviewed 200 people for that report. 200, um, and most of them were people who had actually been at the massacre site. Uh, that's a lot of people to interview. Um, and it's important to say that we, you know, in the methodology, it actually um, strengthens the, uh, the credibility of the report uh, and our claims that our report is accurate if we, um, if we say that we um, interviewed so many people. Uh, I don't know if any of you ha ha has read uh, Mark Bloch, uh, the historian's craft, great French uh, um, historian who was killed by the Gestapo in uh, 1943 and wrote uh, his last book uh, while he was actually um, on the run in the resistance. Um, uh, an extraordinary man. He wrote uh, uh, the historian's craft um, reflecting on the job of the historian. And uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful passage in which he talks about um, Napoleon and the Battle of Austerlitz. And he says, well, you know, if you ask Napoleon what happened at the Battle of Austerlitz, is he going to be able to give you a good account of what happened? I mean, he's maybe standing there on a hill on his horse, but he doesn't have a view of the whole, the whole battle. You know? um, you, no, you can only put together um, a picture of what happened in a battle or in a massacre like this one, which was over a large area, 800 people in one day, if you talk to people from all different perspectives. Um, and, uh, and you also need to, if, as far as possible, talk to people from you know, diff opposing views. So try to talk as well to the security forces, as well as the victims, uh, which is what we sought to do. Um, so it's very important in your methodology to talk about how many people you've spoken to and what their different perspectives uh, were. Um, another important um, uh, aspect of you know, our methodology is to be upfront about the limitations that we have on um, uh, our uh, ability to conduct research into a particular issue. Um, you know, we have not been able to enter Syria for the last two years at least, um, and yet we produce a steady stream of press releases uh, on Syria. How do we do that? Anyone want to give a guess? How do we do it? How do you do a research in a country to which you don't have access? Refugee accounts. Refugee accounts, good. Anyone else got any other ideas? Yep. Field journalists and reporters. Sorry? Field journalists and reporters. Yes, I mean, to some extent, we need, if we, if we use secondary sources, then we need to be upfront about the fact that we're doing that and what the perspective of those people are. Yes, another, any, anything else? Informants inside. Informants inside, whom we reach how? Skype. Skype? <laughs> well, yes, no, I mean, WhatsApp, which is now encrypted from one end to another, so actually probably safer than Skype. Um, cell phone. Um, uh, and that poses additional ethical uh, considerations. Why? Um, but before I get into that, just there's one other there are several other ways, in, fa in fact, in, in which one can do research even when one doesn't have access. Um, one of them is satellite imagery, which we've been using increasingly in Human Rights Watch. And in fact, we're having a meeting tomorrow to talk about the ethics um, of the use of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, in doing human rights research. And I want to talk about that in detail, actually, um, later. Um, but. On the issue of uh, doing remote interviews you know, <coughs> on the telephone um, or on Skype or on a... So ha what are the problems with doing that, do you imagine? What kinds of... You're a human rights researcher. Normally you go into the field, you can look someone in the eye, get their account of an abuse that they suffered themselves or that they witnessed, um, 
What are the problems with interviewing someone on WhatsApp <clears throat> or on the phone? Yeah. Beyond technical issues, um, you'll only have access to people who have access to that technology. That's one thing. So it's sort of there's a select a selection issue. But another thing is that you know when you can't look someone in the eye, or you know it's a fuzzy pixelated picture on your screen. It's, it's actually harder to work out whether they're telling the truth or not, right? Um, so, you know, I think that when we do telephone interviews, we need to be much more careful about corroborating them. You know, you need to get a larger number of people describing the same event in order to have the sort of confidence that, you know, the, 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 the picture that you're painting through these different testimonies and accounts is, is correct, right? Is accurate, is true. Um, as far as possible. Um, another problem with um, uh, with telephone interviews um, or remote interviews is the whole issue of informed consent. So why do we need informed consent um, when we are doing um, interviews with victims of abuses or witnesses to abuses or anyone in fact for a human rights watch report what's what's the significance of informed consent this is something that we talk about a lot at human rights watch as the a reviewer of many documents I often you know come across uh, you know I, I, I go back to a researcher and say have did you actually get conformed informed consent from this person for this interview why is that important yeah so they understand what's happening with the material that you're, getting, you're, you're taking and what you're going to do. Exactly, them. exactly. And that's, and why is that important? Um, well, then I guess you can look back and if, if you need to make references or if you need to follow up with questions, you can always do that. Um, I think it's also important when people want to know. Uh, who are the people that you talk to? Right, They're exactly. Reliable. Good. Yeah, no. I mean, look, one of the things that we really are, you know, very careful about is not only the security of our staff, but the security of the people that we are interviewing, okay. right? And the security of, you know, people that we use to access the people that we interview. This, we usually get to the interviewees through intermediaries of one kind or another, local NGOs or something like that. So anyone who's involved in that process in a country like Syria or Iraq or South Sudan is, you know, at risk, we have to assume. Uh, and often, you know, individuals themselves are best able, as long as they're sort of adults, they're best able to um, uh, assess the risk themselves, right? We also kind of have to assess the risk, but they also, you know, they're, they're part of that. Uh, but in order to assess the risk, they have to know who we are you know, who is Human Rights Watch? What are we going to do with the report? What's the purpose of this report, right? Um, and uh, that's a very important part of the process of securing informed consent. Now, doing that in the field when you have, you know, a controlled setting, hopefully you try and, you know, we always try to do interviews with people in private, right, in an enclosed setting, um, in a secure setting where people feel comfortable. If you're on WhatsApp, you have no idea what kind of situation the person is in on the other end of the line, right? So it's much more difficult to, to be you know, sure that you are really getting informed consent from someone. So you need to you know, make the time, if you like, to, to, when you're preparing an interview remotely and when you're actually conducting the interview to make sure that the interviewee is you know, perfectly comfortable with the arrangement that you've sort of uh, uh, got, uh, got into with them. Um, there are also sort of special groups, I guess, um, which, who pose more uh, problems or more dilemmas, if you like, uh, than others when we interview them. Uh, children, obviously, that's one group because um, you know, they, may, they're, they're, they haven't reached an age of responsibility. It's more difficult to get informed consent for a child, so th there, are, there are issues there that we need to work through. Uh, victims of, of torture and sexual violence, um, there's the risk of uh, re-traumatization, right, 
when we talk to people who have been through horrendous experience, and there's sort of medical evidence for this, there is a real risk that the process of revisiting these experiences can cause re-traumatization. And our researchers are trained to notice, uh, identify the signs of re-traumatization um, so that you know, they can end the interview if necessary or, 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 or start talking about something else. Um, it's very important when you're dealing with people who have been through you know, terrible trauma like this to keep checking in with them in the course of an interview to check that they're feeling okay about talking about all this kind of thing. Um, it's also important, you know, often we will interview people like, um, you know, victims of uh, sexual violence, the, the, the Yazidi women who were uh, captured and abducted by, uh, by ISIS. Um, you know, when they came out, some of them escaped. When they came out, they were in northern Iraq, in the <coughs> Kurdish region of Iraq. Uh, where, you know, at the time, anyway, um, there weren't a great deal of services for, you know, psych psychosocial services for people who were uh, victims of this kind of um, horrendous treatment. Um, and uh, so it was not possible for us to say, well, we're going to do this interview with you, and if you're re-traumatized, you know, we will be able to refer you to, you know, such and such. We, you know, the, the, the services didn't exist. And so, you know, we, we always tell our researchers, actually, you know, you, it may be that there, there are certain groups of people or certain individuals who you just decide they may have a, an amazingly powerful story to tell, which could be an extremely good way of uh, doing the advocacy that is required in order to bring change to this particular situation, right? But nonetheless, you take a decision, you're not going to interview that person because of the risk to their, to, of re-traumatization, uh, especially if in a, in a situation where there isn't a possibility of referring that person to, um, you know, psychosocial services. So those, these are the kinds of dilemmas that a researcher in the field, with the help of, you know, backup in, 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 in headquarters, you know, th this is what we have to deal with all the time, these kinds of... Of, of, of dilemmas, and it's very important that we actually do address those dilemmas in order to be sure that our methodology is transparent, is legitimate, is has integrity, has ethical integrity. Um, because after all, we're a human rights organisation, and uh, if we don't uh, uh, address these issues, um, then um, you know our reputation is at stake. Our ability at Human Rights Watch to to do what we do. To, to go and talk to governments, to be in the media all the time, to, um, to affect change uh, in these human rights crises depends almost entirely on our reputation, right? Our reputation for integrity and our reputation for accuracy. And we need to maintain that by making sure that our methodology is impeccable, right? So we're constantly trying to deal with these dilemmas. There are lots of other issues that go into uh, the methodo methodology reports of uh, um, sections of our reports, and you know, if you're interested, you could read, you know, some of our methodology sections just to sort of follow up. One of them, actually, is um, a good one to read. Uh, is in fact the, the report that I mentioned on the the, the, the massacre in Rabah Square in, in Cairo. Um, it's a it's a very thorough, impressive methodology section um, uh, and it's and it's worth um, it's worth reading one other important aspect of uh, uh, a methodology section and of <coughs> our methodology is um, the importance of getting a response from the government in question right so if we do a report on ISIS abuses we know there's not much point writing to to ISIS saying dear mr. Baghdadi your people are doing this kind of, we don't do that, it's, just, it's a waste of time. But if we're talking about the Egyptian government, or the Burundian government, or the Kenyan government, or whatever, we do have a responsibility to write to the authorities concerned and give them adequate time to respond to our findings, right? So we will write to them towards the end of the process of researching a report. When we've got the findings and we've got the conclusions of our report, We'll put it all together in a letter, and we'll write to the relevant authorities, 
and we'll give them time to give us a response. And often they will give us a, res a response. And in fact, when it comes to business and human rights, <coughs> we often write, we, we always write to the businesses that we name in our, in our human rights, in our business and human rights reports. And in fact, often because of that, um, th those uh, communications, we have managed to secure impact in getting the companies you know, to, out of the kind of abuse business, if you like, before we've even published the report. So I want to um, talk a little bit now about you know, some of the new technology and some of the sort of um, ethical dilemmas that that poses. Uh, and just to sort of introduce that, um, a little anecdote about this report that I keep coming back to, the report on the massacre in Rabat Square, there was a, a little element of that which was not terribly important, but we wanted to estimate how many people were in this square at the time of the, um, uh, of the, of the massacre. And it's notoriously difficult to estimate numbers at big demonstrations or protests. It's always very difficult. And you get hugely widely ranging uh, numbers depending on the sort of political perspective of whoever is doing the, the estimate. So, you know, pro-government demonstrations, the government is always saying it's huge, and the opposition is saying it's a tiny number, and, and the other way around, vice versa. Um, we wanted to get a reasonably good um, estimate. And so we found out that, and we, that the Muslim Brotherhood, during, you know, at the end, right at the end of the, uh, of the demonstration, just before the massacre took place, they had been taking pictures of the demonstrations or filming the demonstration <coughs> using um, unmanned aerial, um, aerial you know, UAVs, drones. Um, and uh, they gave us the footage, and we were able to use this footage to, um, to, to, to estimate the number of people in that, um, in that protest. It was a protest that had been going on for a long time, and so there was a whole encampment and you know, people milling around. And we managed to use that, um, that technology uh, to, um, which we had, we, we had not launched the, the drone ourselves. It was the Muslim Brotherhood that had done it. We used that to, to provide, I think, quite a, an accurate um, estimation of the numbers. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, just as a sort of, you know, to, 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 to end up with, I just as a way of, um, uh, illustrating kind of some of the ethical dilemmas. I want to talk about, you know, should we should Human Rights Watch use unmanned aerial drones? That's actually the subject of, of our meeting tomorrow. You know, we haven't we haven't used we've used material that has been provided to us that has been secured through the use of drones. We haven't used it ourselves. Other NGOs are increasingly using this stuff, this this uh, technology. Should Human Rights Watch use unmanned um, aerial vehicles. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think we, you know, one can talk a bit about, you know, w w why, um, why it would be useful and what the risks are, right? That, that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. I think, you know, there, there are some really interesting uses that one can, one can um, come up with uh, for drones, you know, obviously with cameras attached to them. I mean, we're using satellite imagery at the moment a lot uh, to corroborate, basically to corroborate, uh, pr to provide greater credibility to accounts that we're getting from people on the ground. Um, unmanned aerial vehicle UAVs uh, would be very useful uh, in doing that kind of work, only better, right? But because, first of all, if it's cloudy, you can't take a picture from a satellite, whereas with a drone, you can go under the under the clouds. Secondly, um, the, uh, the resolution from a, a drone, is of, of images from a drone is obviously far better, maybe 20 times better than it is from aerial um, uh, photographs. Uh, you can also take video uh, for up to an hour at the moment. You can get in and provide 3D sort of imaging uh, of um, urban landscapes which is very useful. At the moment, we believe that satellite imagery vastly underestimates war damage. Anyone know why that might be? Anyone got any idea why satellite imagery might underestimate war damage? 
And the answer is that you get a very flat picture. You don't get, you only see from, from right above. You don't see from the sides. And a lot of damage in urban warfare is done to, to the sides of buildings. Um, but also, you know, there may be a tree cover that you can't capture with um, uh, what's going on underneath a tree, obviously, with a, a, a satellite imagery. This kind of thing you can deal with, um, with uh, when, when it comes to um, using drones. Um, you, you, we, could, you, we, we could use it to, uh, to do work on the environment. In fact, already some NGOs have uh, used um, uh, drones to uh, look at um, toxic waste sites, to look at um, the impact of uh, uh, industrial accidents. Um, you, you can do it, you, you can use um, drones uh, to look at detention camps, um, to look at uh, mass graves. Uh, we know that in northern Syria there is a, um, a mass grave. Um, we don't know very much about it, but it seems that this, it's in an area which has been controlled by various different groups, including the government, ISIS, and various other rebel groups. And we believe that all of those groups have used this kind of cave as a place just to dump um, bodies, uh, people that they've slaughtered. Um, we don't know how many people may be in, how many bodies may be in this, this, uh, this, uh, this cave. Uh, but uh, what we do know is that if we, had, if we were able to launch a drone, perhaps across, from across the border in, in, in Turkey, and uh, fly it into the cave, you could get uh, potentially images that could tell you a great deal about you know, this uh, burial site. Um, that is absolutely out of the question for us to go and visit um, on the ground. So you know, the potential uh, for um, the use of, uh, uh, of, of drones is absolutely enormous. But of course, it does uh, pose some pretty serious kind of ethical dilemmas. Um, but there are legal problems, potentially. Um, not that Human Rights Watch is obliged to obey all sort of national laws, but we try to as far as possible. Um, uh, there's no international regulation of the use of drones yet. Um, there are privacy issues, right? Um, uh, and Human Rights Watch is generally more um, uh, rigorous about you know, thinking about privacy issues in publishing reports and photographs and, and so forth than the, me the most media. Um, there are also security issues. I mean, it could put our, us in danger. Although it has a security advantage, we don't have to actually go to these places ourselves. There, there are certainly security issues in you know, wandering around with drones in your pocket, um, especially trying to get through checkpoints and, and things like that. Um, you could be accused of being a spy and, and so on and so forth. And you know, as a result of all this, there are sort of reputational issues that need to be thought through. But the potential for the use of, um, uh, of, of, of this technology is, is enormous. We just need to be sure that, you know, I think, as I hope I've sort of explained in, um, uh, you know, earlier talking about methodology, to be sure that if we do use this technology, we can use it in a way that is you know, transparent, that we're clear about you know, what we're doing and how we're, how we're using it, and use it in a, in a way that you know, we can be confident that this has integrity. We're not invading people's privacy unduly. We're not putting people at risk. It's not just ourselves that we might put at risk. We could also be putting other people at risk inadvertently through the use of this kind of um, technology. Um, so, um, we've got 15 minutes left. So, um, I, I was hoping that you would be more forthcoming. Um, I, I tried to get you to uh, interact. Um, some of you were better than others. Um, but now, it's, there's 15 minutes left. You can, you can ask me any questions you want, uh, whether about you know, what I've been talking about, or more generally about the work of Human Rights Watch. Can you speak a bit more about the image selection process, please? Because reports tend to have quite gripping images. However, they can very easily skew reader perception, be it the disproportionate representation of women and children. But I'm, I'm just hoping if you, if you could speak a bit more about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, 
Should we take several or? Yeah, why don't we take like three and then yeah. we'll start from there. Okay. Do you want to do the paper? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> When you're forming a methodology, do you differentiate between informed consent and meaningful consent? The latter um, dealing with power differentials more than um, informed, informed risk. Right. Um, images. Any, uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm curious about depending on your profession because I, I'm slowly learning that consent varies if you're a storyteller, a journalist, um, like a legal consultant. And it's really interesting for me how there are certain leeways if you are, let's say, a, a storyteller but not a journalist and you can just show up with a microphone and there's implied consent and say, I don't necessarily need to sit down and make you repeat a phrase after me, which is really different from the consent that you were talking about. And I guess in, in your mind as someone who has a more formal process for getting consent, how do you feel about the way that other people are able to be more lax about it because they are not mm. in the field that you are in? Yeah. Well, I'll start with that because, I, I mean, it's sort of um, it's relevant to the other two questions. Um, you know, I mean, if we do what we do because, because of for, for the reasons that I've laid out, you know, we want to be transparent. We want to make sure that the people we talk to are safe. We want to, you know, preserve our integrity. And uh, 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 and we don't actually have a sort of, you know, a form. Uh, it's 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 not written consent. Uh, sometimes we will get written consent if we feel that it's important enough. Uh, and and it's not just for people's stories. Not just for an interview that we want to get consent. We also get consent for the use of people's images, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we have a fairly high standard, I think, compared to journalists, for example. I've worked in the media. You, know. uh, you call up someone for an interview. Um, uh, you know, I, I worked on the, the BBC African service covering wars in Liberia, Sierra Leone, and so on. We would often just try and call anyone we could just to tell us what was going on on a particular day in a particular place because we knew that there's something bad going on. And we, we, we just put them on straight on the air live. Nothing about informed consent or anything like that. Um, and this is the BBC, a respectable news outlet. Right? Um, uh, I think maybe BBC has changed since then. This is a long time ago. But there was no thought about, you know, or if there was, it was hardly kind of conscious about you know the security of the person that we were talking to. Um, uh, it was just all implied. With in, in Human Rights Watch, I think partly because our ability to do our works depends so much upon our reputation, right? Our ability to do what we get up every morning to do, which is to you know end or, or mitigate human rights abuses, depends on the integrity of our work. Um, that's why we have a high bar. I can't talk for others, you know, um, but we do. We do try to have as high a bar as possible. And if I suspect that, you know, because of the way a particular press release or a part of a report has been written, that you know there was less than uh, good enough informed consent, then you know I'll go and ask the researcher who did the interview. You know, what was the informed consent in this particular case? And if, and, and if we feel that it wasn't given, then we will cut that bit out of the, of the report or the press release. Um, when it comes to images, um, you know, I mean, there are different kinds of images that we use. You know, we, most of our researchers are not professional photographers, although some of them are very good. And we will use their work for more than just sort of documenting, you know, so it's like taking a note, right? You know, take pictures um, of someone's wounds, or you know, of a, a fragment of a, a, a cluster munition, or something like that. Um, that might end up in a report. It might not, but it's not taken, you know, in any way in order to sort of um, influence people in the way that a good professional photographer will take a picture that is kind of beautifully sort of. Um, uh, 
framed and, and, and composed. Um, so, so we have that kind of picture, sort of the, 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 the um, workmanlike sort of note-taking type photograph that a, a, a researcher will simply sort of collect in, in the course of their, of their work. Then we do have the, we do actually buy photographs from you know, Reuters or AP or Magnum or any of the photograph agencies in order to illustrate our reports, um, put on the front cover or, or, or whatever. Um, I think there are, you know, we, we often have long discussions, you know, about whether a particular picture should go in for, you know, exactly the reasons that you sort of suggested. Um, you know, is this too manipulative, you know, showing this child, you know, um, uh, so we, we do have those discussions, um, um, and then there, and then there are obviously issues about informed consent and, and privacy and, and so forth. I mean, we have a policy that we do not show pictures of children unless we absolutely have the consent of you know their parent or guardian or whoever's um, responsible for them, as well as the child themselves, because often the children can be part of that discussion. Um, so we we'll, you'll often see pictures of children where you know you can't identify them, just see them from the back, which we will choose over others, or where the face has been blurred out. Um, uh, and then there's the issue of taste as well, right? Um, we did a, we, we had a, a report about the, um, the chemical weapons attack in East Ghouta, outside of Baghdad, uh, outside of Damascus, by uh, Saddam Hussein's forces, Assad's forces. Sorry, I'm mixing up all these dictators. Um, uh, and um, it was a it was a report that was rushed out, and I wasn't actually closely involved in it at the time. I was away or something. But um, there was we ended up with a, a picture on the front cover that was really gruesome. It was very gruesome, um, and there are still we still have debates about whether that was the right decision to have taken. Some people feel very strongly that we shouldn't have done that. It was a, basically a picture of these kids who had been killed um, and uh, by by gas. It was a very a very, a very in, in your face gruesome photograph. And several people in Human Rights Watch think, think believe to this day that that was a mistake, and we, we, we crossed a, a certain line, if you like. And others said no. We needed to um, we needed to be. Uh, upfront about the awfulness of this attack and its, and its impact. So we do have those debates and I think it's not easy always to, 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 to take the right decision or to reach agreement. Right? Um, and then on this issue of informed consent versus meaningful consent, um, I mean for us informed consent has to be meaningful in order to be informed, <laughs> if you like. Um, if it's not meaningful, then you know it's not worth having, and that's why it's not just a question of ticking a box. It's not just a question of someone signing a form. It's a discussion that you have with everyone that you interview, you know, to explain who Human Rights Watch is and what we're going to do with the work and what the potential risks of talking to Human Rights Watch in any particular circumstances are, and it varies from one person to another and from one context to another. And I think that's all I can say. Take two more questions. Sorry, I was going to give Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Julian is <Sorry>. <laughs> um, On the question of drones, it strikes me that the question, the ethical question, isn't really um, should we be using drones, but whose footage are we using? Because the pragmatic issues that you highlighted seem to indicate that maybe while we can't use, uh, we don't have access to drones, or we can't employ them in the field, we might be able to use others' footage. And so when we use the, mother, uh, Muslim, the Muslim Brotherhood's images or other um, groups on the ground, do you guys have that discussion about, well, is this the right um, group to be contacting in the, in the context of the situation? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, again, it, it, de it depends. <laughs> Sorry to um, answer like that, but, you know, I mean, I mean, first of all, I, 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 you know, it's, it's at the moment, yes, that is the question, whether we use it or not, because we're, we're not actually collecting um, material through, through drones our, ourselves. Um, 
but you know, it's, it, it really is a real question whether we shouldn't be getting into the drones business, you know, and, and actually using these things, and launching them ourselves, going to, you know, southern Turkey, launching a, a drone across the border into Syria. Um, it's all probably deeply illegal, but, you know, according to national, these are military areas, you know, from the Turkish point of view, it could be, could be very risky as well. But, you know, it's a debate that's worth having if there is a you know, a, a prize at the end of it that we're going to be able to expose, you know, terrible crimes that we wouldn't otherwise be able to expose, right? So, but, and we are having that discussion, but we haven't reached a decision yet. In the meantime, yes, the question is, should we use the footage or not? When it comes to, and it depends what the footage is of, it depends, it depends on the context. You know, with the, in the case of the Rabah massacre, you know, the Muslim, we already had a very good idea. We had been visiting the protest, I had visited the protest, you know, I had been there like a couple of weeks before the massacre took place. So several of our staff and researchers had been doing interviews, in, so we had a good idea about how many people were in the, we had a sense of the perimeter of the thing, and then we got hold of this footage through the Muslim Brotherhood, and, um, you know, and through our analysis of the footage that we had, we, we realized it was, it was good stuff. It was, it, just because it came from the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't mean, didn't mean that it was tainted, right? Um, uh, so, yes, I mean, but it may, it, that may not always be the case. It may be that, you know, get, getting um, uh, footage from a certain source is problematic, right, for our reputation or, or whatever. I wondered if you could close by talking a bit about about um, sort of professional pathways into this sort of work and for students to understand sort of because this is one way to work in human rights advocacy is work for an organization like Human Rights Watch but is the pathway through journalism is it through some of the some sort of graduate degrees or credentials what mm -hmm. kind of skills do students need what kinds of um, opportunities they need to be looking out for when they're undergraduates and also sort of in the years after graduating yep. to best position themselves to, to come do work like this if that's want to do? Great, well, great question. Um, and uh, I suppose um, uh, the answer is, uh, first of all, you know, you have to be really committed. Um, you know, you're not going to um, make a fortune <laughs> out of working for Human Rights Watch, but it is very rewarding. Um, and uh, the, um, I mean, my own background was unusual, I guess, and I came in at a late stage in my career, so, I mean, I, and I went into journalism when I graduated from university, um, and that is a way of doing it. We do have people who, who come from journalism. Um, but, you know, in terms of the sort of, um, the more formal ways in which people, kind of generally young people, start working for Human Rights Watch, we have, you know, we have a, a small number of fellowships that we give each year, to outstanding students. Some of these are rather limited in, in you know, uh, um, uh, you know the, the criterion for the criteria for applying are rather limited. There are two fellowships. One is you have to be a graduate of Columbia Law School, and the other you have to be a, a, a graduate of New York uh, University Law School. So that's kind of not much good. But there are there are a couple of others which are you know open to to, to others. The the guy who did our Rabba report, which I've ended up talking a, a lot about today, the, the Cairo massacre report, was actually from Stanford. Um, uh, Omar Shakir, um, uh, uh, he joined Human Rights Watch as a fellow, uh, came with, I mean, I did, I interviewed him for the fellowship. He was great. Um, uh, and, uh, and the only problem was he was just too great. We couldn't believe that anyone could be so great. Um, and so some people thought, hey, he seems a bit, you know, too good to be true. Um, anyway, um, uh, he, he, and he did a fantastic job, you know, fluent Arabic, um, working for a year in Cairo undercover when, you know, the Egyptian government was completely against it. Did a great job. Um, and is, and it is actually joining us, you know, on staff next year. Um, in the role of our, our, our Israel um, uh, researcher, Israel Palestine researcher. Um, uh, so the f there's fellowships, right? They're few and far between, but definitely worth applying for. Um, there's uh, internships um, that are, you know, we have many, many internships ranging from 
you know, a few weeks to a few months, um, and uh, you know, we have there are quite strict rules on um, what we give interns to do. So you won't be given administrative work. We can't give you administrative work. We have to give interns um, substantive work. It's interesting. It's a really good chance to learn about Human Rights Watch. Uh, we also have, you know, lower level support staff, uh, um, associate, they're called associates, um, whose job is sort of, I would say, 75% administrative, 25% substance. Um, they are, these are paid position staff members. Um, and, um, uh, and considering what a lot of administrative work they do, we get incredibly qualified people um, applying for those jobs and getting those jobs. People with you know, graduate you know, qualifications and, and all sorts of things. And that is a way in, although I must, you know, I think when, when those people come in, we do warn them that they're gonna be doing, a, you know, they're often overqualified for what they're doing. We warn them that you know, there, isn't, there isn't a pathway from that level to researcher level. Most associates who end up being researchers, they, they leave the organization for a bit and then they come back as researchers. Um, but you know, just finally, you know, I would say the most important thing if you want to be a researcher at Human Rights Watch, is to gain some area expertise or some thematic expertise. Um, and, and linguistic skills really help as well. Um, because you know, we are looking, we are always looking for people who really can be the best researcher on a particular area, on a, in, on a particular country. And that will often mean someone who's a real expert in that particular theme or country including having the contacts, having the language, having the sort of background. So if, if I mean, that is a really important way of, 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 of getting into this kind of work, getting area expertise, particularly in parts of the world that maybe other people aren't particularly, they're not particularly popular, right? Um, Africa, Middle East, Asia, you know, um, that's, a, that's a really, um, a good way in. And, you know, do try if you're, if you're interested, it's a great, it's a, it's a great job. And I would just end by sort of emphasizing that I know a lot of you are coming from different disciplines. Obviously, the humanities and social sciences tend to be represented in this field and the legal pathways, but we have engineers, we have tech folks, and I think we've seen through Tom's comments the applications that those, those um, disciplines can bring to this field, thinking through these questions of drones and technology. And um, Human Rights Watch about three years ago hired a quantitative expert. Um, Brian Root, who has all their methodology and quantitative work. So those of you that love data and data analysis can also think about entry through that way. Um, you can basically find ways to apply your skills, I think, to these the area of human rights. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to um, the Haas Center and VPUE for supporting this event. This has been part of our new um, human rights and community series. Um, so this is the second one. So um, we'll be doing more of these in the next academic year where we really try to create these more intimate conversations with human rights practitioners um, so that you all can learn more. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Tom and Human Rights Watch and we'll see you soon.